Bonjour à tout le monde. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, happy to be here again. Last two times I was here, we were not yet in a bull market, so it's it's good to be back in a bull market. But obviously, as we are, as we were going through some difficult years from 2011 to 15, obviously one still has to question: um, Was that the bottom, or will we see another? ugly bear market soon. That's the disclaimer, which for time reason we skip rather fast. Um, that's the agenda. I'm talking about gold, why gold equities, and very shortly why our fund. The gold side is driven mainly by investment demand. I mean, jewelry is important, the supply is important, we see supply coming back in the next few years, but at the end of the day, investment demand has always been the key driver of the gold price. And something we are addressing today is something we feel the market is very sleepy about it, it doesn't recognize the problem yet, but this is the key reason why gold and why even the recent correction is something which we consider as a buying opportunity and not something to get nervous about. The key reason for gold for the next few years to rise massively is the unsustainable situation which is being shown in a kind of trust. We are heading into a confidence crisis as we've been heading into the 70s or into 2011. People are losing confidence in the system, in the government, in the central banks, which are cornered now by the markets, into the banking system, and finally, in a few years, into the currencies. And this is why gold will move much higher than where we are today. And this confidence crisis, you see it very easily if you look at election results, regional elections in Italy, Italy, in France, in Germany, in Austria, Brexit decision and Donald Trump. It shows we are heading into a new confidence crisis and this was always the biggest driver behind gold bull markets. The situation of getting the lowest yield since 5,000 since 5, years combined with the worst debt situation ever just doesn't make any sense. Why should one get the lowest risk premium for the highest risk? Only stupid guys buy that. Our central banks buy it. The insurance companies have to buy it. So there are buyers around. Now coming back to maybe what people are nervous these days, especially after Trump, the dollar, Fed fund cycle, real rates. We clearly said in the last two conferences the, uh, the lights are turning from red into green. We are now back in green. This dollar strength is a joke. It's unsustainable, if you ask me, unless we get a major crisis in Europe. Donald Trump wants a lower dollar. The US is not competitive. Five years ago, the trade deficit was over 600 billion, and everyone was expecting that to shrink a lot, given that 40%, over 40% of the trade deficit was oil-related. Today, it's still sitting above 600 billion per year, and there is no, not a lot of oil anymore being imported. So the structural trade deficit is going up consistently, and this is the reason why the dollar since Bretton Woods is a weak currency. If you look at the strong currency since 1970, it's the Swiss franc, Japanese yen, and German mark. Three countries with the lowest growth, the lowest yields, the lowest interest rates, but current account surpluses, which come, with the exception of Switzerland, from the trade side. And this is why the dollar is in the long run a very weak currency. Donald Trump can't change the problem we have globally in the industrialized nations, which are over indebtedness and demographic issue, i.e. we are all getting too old. Gray hair is rising, it's coming up every year. So <clears throat> this is the reason why we are not nervous and consider the recent situation as a great buying opportunity. 
The Fed fund cycle is the same joke. People feel Donald Trump wants to be aggressive on, on hiking rates. If he would implement that through the Fed, which is anyway a bit difficult, but many things are possible in the US, um, it would lead to a higher dollar, contrary to what Donald Trump wants. If you look at Japan, and don't forget, what we see now in Europe and in the US is the same as Japan exhibited from 1990 to 2010. It's a so-called balance sheet recession. Too much debt and too much old people doesn't work. Japan tried it with infrastructure programs many times. It always led to a short bump in economic growth, maybe even a short rise in yields like we have seen recently but not sustainable. This does not fix the problem. We need a reset, but no political guy wants a reset because he won't be elected after the reset. So real rates, again, have been rising 10 basis points. It's no joke. I just read it this morning in the train, and people are nervous about that. And don't forget, Japan and the US are competing on the monetary side. If you look at central bank policy, sometimes the US introduces an action a few months later, Japan. Now Japan went out, the BOJ, with a very important signal which the market is sleeping about. And they said, we will fix the long-term yields. We will not allow long-term yields to rise. And for good reasons, because it would kill Japan, but it also would also kill Europe and the US. So don't be surprised if the Fed comes out in a few days, for you a few weeks, or maybe a few months, and tells the world, don't fight against us. We will buy unlimited on the long end to keep the curve down. Because this is called financial repression, and the Fed hopes without war or without social unrest to get out of the crisis. I'm not sure if it will work, but at least they will try it as Japan does it. And you can be sure the Fed doesn't even need to buy bonds because the day they make the announcement, no one will hesitate to, to battle against the most powerful central bank in the world. So they don't even need to buy it. And don't forget the Fed did it already in the 90s, 50s for many years the long-term yields were fixed by the Fed and the market accepted it. So with inflation coming up in the mid to long, long term, thanks to these programs, some inflation will come up at the same time, the long-term yields will stay very low, so real rates go more negative again, and this will be also a driver behind gold. But don't forget the big thing is the confidence thing. People are losing confidence it started with government, it's going on now with central banks. We'll see it in the government bond markets and finally in the currencies. This is an interesting observation from Ned Davis showing since 1926 to 2015, when should you add gold to a balanced portfolio? There are exactly three environments and we are not gold bucks, we found that the fund in 99, and we will close it in a few years when the cycle is over. So, but this comes from an independent resource, Ned Davis, quality research about 10 times better than what you get from any bank or any broker. You need to have gold in a balanced portfolio if and when the US stock market is expensive. Today, we are trading on trailing P, 60% above long-term averages, on Schiller P, 80%, 80% above long-term average. If you look at price book, price sales, we have the highest valuation ever. Markets are expensive. Then more interesting, the one to the right. Gold does very well when the Fed was hiking rates in the past. Contrary to what all these brokers and banks are trying to tell you. Don't forget, banks have no interest in recommending gold. It's the worst asset from them. It's the smallest margin. And in the worst case, the client even takes the physical away, so they lose even the assets under management. I've been working for banks, and this is why Swiss banks recommended gold the first time in 2011. It was a good timing. 
I sold my gold then. So Fed hiking cycle is not a problem for gold because the Fed is always, with one exception, Paul Falcon 1980, behind the inflation curve. And the market will come back to this correlation. We don't know when, but the unrealistic thing, what's happening right now in the last few weeks with higher rates, it's, it's very normal. You know, today there are so many big hedge funds and even asset managers just have models. Long yields go up, go long dollar, short yen, short, short gold, long Nikkei, etc. No chance for human beings to act as quickly as these computers do, but doesn't mean the computers will be right. Number three was, by the way, when long-term rates go up. Just all, so actually exactly the environment we have today. As a summary on gold, I think I need to speed up a little bit. Um, just two things. The gold ETF, which were sold from investors between 2013 to 2015, went from so-called weak hands, short-term oriented investors in Europe and the US, into very strong hands into Asia, and the negative interest rates environment opens the door for new investors for gold. In, where they said for the last 15 years, as long as, get, as I get my 1%, 2% risk-free, I'm not interested in gold, they are changing their view now. Now moving to the miners. It's really getting interesting because we are at the start of a new bull market and what's very important, this is really the phase where you have to be in gold miners. November 2000 to end of 2003, massive outperformance against physical. In this phase, gold stocks do 5 to 15 times what physical does. Afterwards, the bull market, very bad for gold stocks, mismanagement, higher costs, etc. No real leverage anymore. But we are again now, since a few months, in this phase. The good thing is here, as here, companies have operating leverage, have financial leverage, management teams are disciplined, costs are under control, and gold stocks start discounting higher future gold prices. This is why in this phase you really have to be in the minus and not in physical. If, if you went through the bear market with physical, I told that many clients or many prospective clients in the last 24 months, you need one move and all the loss which you made on physical is gone by the gains in the gold miners, which happened this year already. But this is just a start. From the November 2000 low to end of 2002, just this very first phase, gold went up 20%, gold miners went up 340%. We could be in a similar situation. Valuation very quickly, the sector is at its lowest level since 30 years based on price cash flow. Price book, this, this was before Trump, so it's actually even lower, it's around one times book value now. The last big bull market in 2000, November started at 1.1 book value, went to 4.7 and gold stocks continued to rise for two years, but the ratio came down because over the cycle book value grows within the companies as well. So very, very cheap, very, very attractive. When do you buy gold miners? You buy miners when the commodity sector makes no money or when the margins are at the bottom. This is since 1990. This is the relative performance of gold miners between S&P. And as you can see, you always buy the miners when the commodity sector's margins are at the bottom. They recently were at the lowest level since 1950. And as a result, you see our performance starts. What's important, the first part of the cycle is always much bigger outperformance than later on. But it's a great addition to a balanced portfolio, a few percentages gold miners. This is the dark side of this industry. It's a crazy industry. In 77 years, the industry lost seven times between 67 to 84 and a half percent. The good thing is, even if we didn't like it, the last bear market was the worst ever with 84.5% and it was the second longest. Very close to the bear market in 96 to 2000. However, once you pass that, it becomes interesting, especially if you can buy like recently after a big sell-off, which we have seen. 
but gold stocks are volatile. We all know that. And there's a long way to go. Where, we could, where could we go? This is our product performance since the bottom, about 120%. In the last cycle, we made 1,450% for our investors. That's in US dollar. Similarities, before we had a four, three quarter year bear market, a decline of 84%. Now we had a four, one third year bear market, 84.5%. Even in this mini cycle, which wasn't really an industry cycle, after a seven months decline of 71%, the product made 500%. That's here the sister product actually, because the fund was only launched in 2003, the usage fund, while our, our Cayman fund is in place since 99. So where do we go? What's our suggestion? We believe at least 1,000% is the target from the bottom, which is about 500 from today, in the next three to four years. It's not a forecast, but it's our clear view on the sector. Now, when to buy this sector? Because it's bloody volatile and it's annoying if you lose 37%, like recently from the top early August. But we look back into the bull markets, number one bull market 2000 to 2007, then the second bull market October 08 to 2011. So it's very normal to lose between 25 to 35 percent. That was the worst correction, but it makes sense because the rise before was 182 percent, which was also the biggest rise anyway. From a Fibonacci retracement point of view for technical guys, we had a very nice 62.8% Fibonacci retracement, which is, by the way, what happened in most of the cases. So very nice buying opportunity. We are 80 to 90% convinced that was the bottom or we see the bottom in the next few days. And then we get the next probably 100% plus. So great time to buy. Now you can buy companies, you can also buy a fund. The fund provides you probably much lower risk as we are well diversified. But if you buy the right fund, you actually have probably even more leverage than with most companies, especially the larger cap names. Now, this is our track record. We are bull market manager. We outperform our peer group massively in bull markets. We are slightly, very slightly worse in bear markets. But if you are bullish like we are, it's a perfect product. As you can see here, our active and passive peer, the Black Crocs, the Fenex, uh, the Talk Wheels, and uh, the GDX, etc., we do around 1.5 times. Actually, in this bull market, we did 1.65 times. Um, so it really pays off to go with an active managed fund, as these passive products are quite a nightmare. In bear markets, you see around one times the performance of the peer group. So coming to the summary, or, or maybe just one, one little word, how do we do that? We have a very nice size. We are, have about 400 million, which makes things quite easy. So we can speak to the companies, we can offer them deals. We currently offer, again, money to many companies. We get private placements with nice warrants which help the performance on the way up. Then another thing, we are owner of the firm. We put a lot or nearly everything of, all our, of our own money into the products. So our interests are, are aligned with our investors' interests. Then we play this, the cycle of the industry more actively than our peers. So we have been preparing, as I've been telling you already one or two years ago, we have been preparing the fund for the next bull run, while our competition went very defensive in the last two years. They got scared like most investors. We got very interested and got, got very attractive, uh, very, very offensive, I would say. So we play, we increase the numbers of the smaller cap names. We have on average also five to 15% more small caps than our peers, but it's not a small cap fund. If someone wants to buy a small cap fund, we also have a small cap fund, which is even more attractive from a return risk perspective than this one, but it's not for retailers. Actually, it's qualified investors only as it is a Cayman fund. So this is how we do it. 
And as a summary, I don't want to repeat myself. I'm probably already slightly one, two minutes above budget. So uh, thanks for, for your interest. I'm around here in case you have more questions. Thank you very much.